ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh i want to start off uh, tonight's halaqa by just sharing a reflection on um, the verses that were recited in uh, Salatul Isha. So in the second raka, uh, our beloved brother and Shaykh Abdul Rahman, he recited verses from uh, Surah Al-A'raf, particularly the, the verse that I want to focus on is verse 44. And in verse 44, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in the hereafter, people will call out, the people of Jannah will call out to the people of Jahannam, that Surely we found what our Lord has promised us. Did you find what your Lord has promised you? And then someone from amongst them will call out, uh, after they say yes, that we did find what our Lord promised us, someone from amongst them will call out that surely the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon the oppressors. Now when I think about this verse, I think about the power of this verse, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that there's only two camps in the hereafter, the people of, of Jannah and the, and the people of, of Jahannam. There is that small minority who are the people of Araf that there's a lot of discussion about. But at the end of the, the day, is you're either from the people of Jahannam or the people of, of Jannah. Those are the only two options. And I think about the visualization or the imagery that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set forth. That imagine all of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for you in Jannah. And I want to do a, a, a small activity. Who can share something that they would like to do in Jannah? Who can share with me something that they would like to do in Jannah? Go ahead. Uh, uh, Jannah. You want to have a house in Jannah? Excellent. Our sister in the back, go ahead. You want to fly? Okay, may Allah make it easy. Our, our sister over here? To see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the, the greatest of blessings that we will be talking about. And we'll take one more over here. Go ahead. To meet the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Great activities. And each and every individual will have whatever they desire. And the people will testify to this, that yes, we found everything that our Lord promised us. But at the exact opposite end of the spectrum that we're talking about are the people of Jahannam. And they are people that they will be asked, did you find what your Lord has promised you? And for me, that is very petrifying. That is very, very scary. Because while we enjoy the benefits and luxuries uh, of Jannah, there is that reality that what if we don't make it there and we seek refuge and protection from Allah now this is not to, to scare people but this is to present a reality that we need to to have our goal in mind have our vision in mind have our focus in mind that we want to be the people of paradise we want to focus we want to be those that question out did you find what your Lord promised you to be true we want to be that camp that's who we want to be but in order to get to that camp, you have to take action. You have to be doing actions from the people of paradise. And this is what I wanted to start off with, that keep that reality in mind. Like you know on your calendars you have, on such and such date I have an exam, on such and such date I have an important meeting. On our calendar should also be that sooner or later we're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is that meeting going to be like? And eventually we will either pass or we will fail. Are we putting in the adequate preparation to be from the people that succeed? And from time to time, just keep revisiting this verse. Because I'm telling you, just imagining and visualizing what that conversation looks like. Where the people of Jannah are on top and they're questioning the people of Jahannam at the bottom as they're being punished. Did you find what your Lord promised you to be true? Meaning that the people of Jahannam will know, they would have known that their crimes that they committed came with a punishment. And that is when they will shout out, yes, we found it to be true. And there's no escaping that. The people of Jannah will have their luxuries and their fulfillment of their desires. And the people of Jahannam will have punishment and pain. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents both of those scenarios so that we seek refuge in one and distance ourselves from the actions of that group and make our goal and ambition the other and make sure our actions align with the actions of those people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq. Ameen. With that being said, we're going to do a quick recap 
of what we took last week. So we'll, last week we took 10 of them. We're just going to quickly read through them, inshallah. From the benefits is realizing the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship and his all-encompassing power. Number two, realizing the humility of servitude. They acknowledge that they belong to him, that they are but lowly servants of his, that they will return to him for judgment and are subject to his decree and regulation. They know that they have nowhere to flee from him and no way to escape him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then actualizing sincerity for Allah because there's no way to repress hardship except by recoursing to him. And there's no one that, when, that one can depend on to remove it except him. Number four, turning in penitence, inaba, and we discussed that last week, to Allah and directing one's heart to him. Submissiveness and supplication is number five. And number six is forbearance. And number seven is forgiving the human agent who caused the trial. There was something that um, I wanted to read out, but I didn't get a chance to last week, so I'll do that now. This is a statement from one of the scholars of hadith by the name of Ibn Hibban, rahimahullah. He's compiled a, a compilation of hadith, but he's also done small articles and essays that deal with the, the softening of the heart. And he says, it is necessary that the intelligent, uh, that the intelligent accustom his soul is to forgiving people and to leave repaying evil with evil. I mean the intelligent person, he'll make it a habit that he leaves off seeking revenge and learns to forgive. This is because there is nothing that would silence an evil better than good treatment and beneficence. And there is nothing that would stir up evil more than repaying evil with evil. I mean that there's no good deed that is better than repaying evil with good. And you will see the evil of revenge in the evil that revenge causes. Meaning that no good scenario has ever come out of someone seeking revenge. Whoever desires copious reward to receive devout love and good mention, let him experience the bitterness of opposing his base desires and taking to the way we have highlighted, joining relations when they have been severed, giving in the face of prevention, helm in the face of ignorance, and forgiveness in the face of oppression. These are the greatest morals and manners of the religious. So he goes on to mention that when you hold these characteristics, particularly of forgiveness, when people have wronged you, it comes with copious reward, meaning a great amount of ajr. It comes with a devout love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a good mention. And this good mention is in the heavens with the angels and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's also on this earth that when people have the ability to seek revenge and they withhold from that revenge and they learn to forgive, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires love into the hearts of the people so that this person is mentioned as this is a person that is forgiving and he has set a lofty example. And then he goes on to mention specific things. That let him experience the bitterness of opposing his base desire and taking the way to, uh, to that we have highlighted. Meaning that forgiving people, there's a bitterness and there's a hardship that comes with it. No one says forgiving people is going to be easy. So understand that yes, it will be bitter, but that is part of the struggle in attaining that reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he gives specific examples of what this looks like. That when people are cutting you off, you go out of your way to keep those ties of kinship. So those family members that have tried to cut you off, you go out of your way to keep ties with them. You give in the way of uh, when you are being prevented. Meaning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has withheld his risk from you, then you find it in your heart, you find some way somehow to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hilm in the face of ignorance. That when people mistreat you, they say derogatory things about you, they're very hasty to make judgments about you, you withhold and you refrain and you do not respond in kind. And then last but not least, you forgive in the, way, uh, in the face of oppression. Then when people oppress you, you find a way to forgive them. And he says that these are the greatest characteristics and morals and manners that the people of religion can have. Which I think is something very, very powerful, particularly on our day and age. If you look at how religious people are portrayed uh, on TV, um, who can, th actually the, the most appropriate example that I can think of is Ned Flanders. For those of you that have watched The Simpsons, like Ned Flanders is this preachy guy. He's not very smart. He's always preaching and bothering his neighbors. Uh, and he can't seem to do things right. Like religious people are, are not viewed in a positive light. And you can pretty much see any show, any news media clip. Like you think about how Muslims are portrayed as terrorists. The, the Vatican and the church is portrayed you know, as, as abusers of children. 
Like the people of religion are not viewed in a positive light. So how do you counter that? You counter that by holding these characteristics. And eventually, if every person of religion was to hold on to these characteristics in particular, eventually the, the, the narrative in the media and in society changes as well. And you have to understand it is an uphill battle, but that is part of the struggle that we change ourselves and eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the society around us as well. So I wanted to highlight that about point number seven. Which brings us to, oops, I, I skipped point number eight. Patience and steadfastness in the face of affliction. This leads to Allah's love and an increase in His rewards. Which brings us to number nine. Um, which is experiencing joy uh, at the onslaught of the calamity because of the many benefits it contains. And I wanted to share a hadith that I skipped last week, which is reported by Al-Bayhaqi. Abu Umama radiallahu anhu, he reports that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah tests you through tribulation in order to refine you, just as you refine gold with fire. Amongst you are those who are left as resembling pure gold, such as a person whom Allah has saved from evil deeds. Amongst you are those who are left resembling gold of a lesser quality, such as a person who falls into some decree, degree of doubt, and amongst you are those who are left resembling black gold. Such a person is one who gives in to the trial. So here the Prophet ﷺ, he gives this example of extracting uh, gold. And gold, it is often uh, surrounded by ore, it is surrounded by coal, it is surrounded by this material that leaves a stain on your clothes, it, it, it smells, it doesn't have a pleasant odor. But in order to actually get to that gold, you have to put fire to it. You have to put fire to the coal in order to extract the coal. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu mentions over here, that when you put the fire to the coal, three things, one of three things will happen. Either you will get that pure gold that you're seeking, or you will get a lesser quality of the gold that still has some remnants of the coal, or in fact you will not reach that gold whatsoever, and that gold is still there, that potential is still there, but it's still surrounded by the coal. And this is the example of the one in terms of how they respond to those trials. Those individuals that get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognize that this life is temporary and they make the akhirah their focus, then they end up becoming that pure gold. Those individuals that from time to time they have some doubts as to why is Allah trying me? You know, is this actually part of a greater plan? You know, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have the best interest, my best interest in mind? Those sort of doubts. Then these people, inshallah, they'll still get through, but they're considered the lesser quality of the gold. Then there's those individuals that completely fail. What does failure in trials and tribulation look like? Those are the people that turn to disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as I mentioned, they become abusive, they start to curse and swear, they become uh, addicted to substances, or rather use substances as a distraction from their problems like alcohol and like drugs. That is what failure looks like. But what's interesting is that the Prophet wasallam mentions that they are black gold, meaning that that potential is still there in them. You don't give up hope on these people, but in that particular trial, they have failed. Meaning that they still have another chance that when their next trial comes, then inshallah they can find their way out of it. So there's never a time when you give up completely on a person that has failed a trial. But rather be that helping hand as we've been talking about and try to help them for the next time that when they're in that state of trial, inshallah they can succeed and they are from that pure gold or from the lesser quality of that gold. Which brings us to number 10, being grateful at the onset of calamity because of the many benefits it contains. Comparable of this is the case of a sick person thanking a doctor who has just amputated one of his limbs in order to save his life, even though this would serve to disable him to some extent. Which brings us now to continuing where we left off, which is point number 11. It's expiation of sins and errors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Al-Shu'ara, وَمَا أَصَابَكُم مِّن مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٍ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, any disaster that strikes you in through what your hands have earned and He pardons much. is through what your hands have earned and He pardons much. Meaning that trials and tribulations that come our way, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are through decisions and actions that we make. And had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted evil for us, 
then he would have held us accountable for each error and each sin and each mistake that we make. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons a lot of those mistakes and he forgives a lot of those mistakes and does not hold us accountable. Now, in return, what actually happens? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, and we'll talk about this shortly, that the believer is not afflicted with an illness or hardship, even if it be a worry that troubles him or a thorn that pricks him, except that his sins would be expiated as a result. Meaning that if you're afflicted with illness or a hardship or even a thought that makes you worried, even the thought that makes you worried, or a thorn pricks you, some of your sins are being forgiven. Some of your sins are being forgiven. Now what do we want to focus on over here? Number one, the greater the trial from Allah, the greater the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that's so important to keep in mind. Because when you go through trials, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is increasing your opportunity for forgiveness. And that's something that you have to keep in mind. That at the end of the day, some people will earn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy through the good deeds that they do. Other individuals will earn the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being patient upon the trials that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to them. So certain individuals, due to their lack of good deeds being done, JazakAllah khair. Certain individuals, due to the lack of good deeds being done, they will earn the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the trials that they go through, through the trials that they go through. And that's an important perspective to keep in mind, that as a human being, you want to keep that balance in mind, that am I doing enough good deeds to wipe out my sins? Because if I'm not doing enough good deeds to wipe out my sins, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends those trials my way to purify me of those sins, to purify me of those sins. And I want to expand upon this even greater, that as we started off this halaqa by talking about Jannah and Jahannam being destinations, Jannah is the purest of abodes. And no one will enter Jannah except that he has been purified already. So there's no purification in Jannah, but you will be purified before you get to Jannah. When does that purification process begin? It begins in this life. And you go through multiple stages. So you will be purified in this life through the good deeds that you do or through the hardships and calamities that you face. And that is the only time where you can do good deeds to, to lessen your, your, your sins. Then the next phase is at the time of death. At the time of death, there, are, there is hardship, there is calamity through which you are being purified of your sins. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he was, you know, the struggle he had was twice the amount of any average human being. And he sweated profusely. And this is actually a, a good sign of one's death that if there is a severe fever or severe sickness before the person passes away, this is actually considered a good sign because it is a sign of purification. That is the second time where purification will take place. The third time purification will take place is in the grave itself. This will be through questioning, this will be through punishment, this will be through the darkness, this will be through the squeezing and multiple things that will happen in the grave. That's stage number three. Stage number four is on the day of judgment, is on the day of judgment itself. This will be when the reckoning is happening. This will be when you're crossing the Sirat. This will be when people will hold each other accountable before they enter into Jannah. And that will be stage number four. And if people haven't been purified and cleansed by that time, there is a stage number five, which is being in Jahannam for a short period of time. The believers will never be in Jahannam forever or for eternity or for as long as Jahannam lasts. But rather they will only be there for a short period of time till they are purified and then they are entered into Jannah at that time. They are entered into Jannah at that time. As a class, can we repeat the five stages? What is stage one of purification? Excellent. So it's in the life of this world where you're doing good deeds to wipe out your sins or you're seeking forgiveness. And if that hasn't happened, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends trials and tribulations your way. Go ahead. Excellent. At the time of death, the hardships and calamities that you face from the sisters, what was number three? Go ahead. 
Punishment in the grave. Excellent. That is phase number three. Number four from the sisters as well. What was phase number four? Yep. On the day of judgment itself. And we said number five was a possibility, not for everyone. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from it. And those are the believers that will be dipped into the hellfire. And then they are purified and entered into Jannah. So now when you keep this in mind, that your sins are purifying you, this should also help change your perspective that you would rather be cleansed and purified in this dunya where you still have some relative options of control. That you can control your response, you can control the good deeds you do, you can control the du'as that you make, you can control the forgiveness that you seek, you can control the help that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And once you get past this, then there's no coming back. So that is why it is important to understand that when we're talking about being grateful for calamities, this is why people are grateful. That it protects them from being purified in the hereafter where you do not have control of those things and the punishment and accountability is much, much more severe. Punishment is much, much more severe. At this point, I also wanted to share with you uh, a couple of statements. And this is from Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar rahimahullah. He says, so whoever is in a state of receiving favors, it is obligatory upon him to show patience and gratitude. Patience from disobedience. Whoever is in a state of trial, it is obligatory upon him to show patience and gratitude. And gratitude by establishing the rights of Allah during trial. Indeed, servitude is due to Allah in times of tribulation and in times of ease. So Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, he's sort of tying in points 10 and 11 together where part, point number 10 was about being grateful and point number 11 is about understanding the virtue of having sins being forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how a person is going to be in a station of being patient and in a station of gratitude at all times. Meaning that should never come a time where you're not showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there, should, there will never come a time where you are not in need of patience. So in times of calamity, patience is very easy. You stay away from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also in times of prosperity, people lose focus of that. They think that, you know what, I have free reign to commit sin in times of prosperity. But that's what brings on the calamity. If in times of prosperity, you can control yourself and refrain from that sin, then this further elongates the prosperity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This further elongates the prosperity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which brings us to point number 12. Oops. Showing mercy to those who are undergoing affliction and coming to their trial and aid. You know, there are certain calamities that people go through that other people just can't relate to them until they've experienced it themselves. Until you've experienced it yourself, you have no idea what that feels like. And again, this is like the severe trials that I'm talking about, you know, children that go through abuse, losing uh, a, a, a beloved family member, like losing your child while you're alive. These are severe trials that individuals will go through that people can't really relate to. So what the author is trying to do over here is help us understand that all of the trials that you go through, one of the objectives behind them is to make you more merciful and compassionate and empathetic towards those that are going through similar trials. And that every individual goes through their own trial. Just like everyone sins and everyone sins in their own way, people are tried and people are tried in their own ways as well. And one of the mistakes that we always make is thinking that, oh, I wish I had such and such is life. I wish I had their job, I wish I had their family, I wish I had their car, I wish I had X, Y, and Z of theirs. Not realizing that with those blessings that Allah gave them, they are going through their own trial. They are going through their own trial. And the objective of trial is to make us more compassionate and more merciful. And this is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is the first hadith that every student of knowledge will learn. You start to study hadith, this is the very first hadith you will learn where the Prophet ﷺ says, Irhamu man fi dunya, irhamukum man fi sama. That have mercy and compassion upon the inhabitants of the earth 
and he who is above the heavens shall have mercy and compassion upon you. So when you look at trials and tribulations, understand that it's meant to rectify your inside as well. And it's meant to increase your mercy and compassion. Such that when you see someone struggling, you make it an objective for yourself that I need to help them out of it. I need to help them out of it. And this is very obvious that I want you to think about if you saw someone in a ditch and you're walking by, would you not try to help them out of the ditch? If you're walking by and someone is drowning in water, would you at least not call someone to help them or at least try yourself to help them? You would. So if we would help people through physical trials, why is it we are not willing to help people through psychological, emotional, and spiritual trials? We have to create that awareness that people are being tried. We may not always be able to see it, but sometimes it manifests itself through different actions. Someone that used to come to the masjid regularly, all of a sudden is no longer coming to the masjid. A sister that used to wear hijab, all of a sudden takes it off. What ends up happening in these situations is judgment. Oh, oh, you know, they did such and such and this is why such and such happened. Oh, their iman must be low and this is why they're being punished by X, Y, and Z. But that's not what these trials and tribulations call for. These trials and tribulations call for mercy and compassion. So understand that everyone goes through trials sooner or later. And if you want a helping hand during your moments of trials and tribulation, you have to be there in the moments of trials and tribulations of others. Allahu fi auni abdihi ma yakunu abdu fi auni akhihi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the help and aid of his servant and slave as long as that servant is in the help and aid of their brothers and sisters. So understand when you see a spiritual trial, a psychological trial, an emotional trial, it doesn't call for judgment, it calls for empathy and mercy. It calls for conversation and asking them, how can I help you out of this? How can I help you out of this? And people will have insecurities, but you need to be there, be a constant in their life, willing to support them so that they feel safe and secure seeking your help at that time. And he shares verses of poetry. He says, the only one to show mercy upon the lovers is the one who has loved. And in Arabic, I guess that makes more sense than it does in English. But the point being, you know, you can only manifest love if you've experienced love itself. Which brings us to, actually, um, he mentioned something else which I wanted to share as well. And this is reported in the Muatta of Imam Malik. It's a statement of Isa alayhi salam, meaning Prophet Isa alayhi salam. It's a statement recorded by Imam Malik, where he says, people are either living in times of ease and well-being or facing tribulation. So be merciful to those who are facing tribulation and thank Allah for your own well-being. So again, he mentions that in this life, you know, you're either in times of prosperity or times of adversity. When you come across someone who's in a time of adversity, be merciful towards them and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your own well-being. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're not being tested with something similar. Which brings us to point number 13 now, which is understanding the greatness of the blessing of ease and well-being. And th uh, this is because uh, they are never truly appreciated until one loses them. This is a statement that all of us are familiar with. That we will never truly appreciate blessings until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them away from us. So in times of ease, one should understand that these blessings can be taken away at any given time. And don't wait till they're taken away to appreciate them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But rather in those times of prosperity, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. So from the, the blessings of these trials and tribulations is that they make us grateful for what we have. You know, oftentimes people relate this to relationships, but I think you need to take this at a much higher level, which is things like your eyesight, things like your health, things like your ability to breathe without needing an external apparatus, things like you not needing your blood to be distilled and purified every couple of weeks. Like all of these things are big blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet seldom do we take time to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. And this is such an important activity that needs to be done on a daily basis. 
finding time to recognize the things that you are you're blessed with in this moment. Some of them are universal, like life. Others are very personal. Certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you that very few other people have that they wish they could have from you. So general blessings and specific blessings, taking an opportunity every night to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. And this is such an important activity to create optimism in yourself and to create gratitude. And when people are grateful, they are happy people, which ties in to our mental health discussion that part of improving our own mental health is recognizing the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. Number 14, understanding what Allah has caused to be the outcome of these uh, benefits in terms of reward in the hereafter. Meaning that when people are tested and tried, there are benefits that you will only see in the hereafter. Yes, there are some benefits to this dunya as well, but the benefits in the hereafter that are unknown, that are unknown. And we mentioned this last week that the people of patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards them without hisab. So there are certain things that you will have to look forward to in the hereafter that are a result of these trials and tribulations. And these are like your private conversations with Allah. I want you to think about things that you truly desire in the hereafter. And take a moment to actually think about this deeply. What is it that you truly desire in the hereafter? What is it that you absolutely hate about this dunya? And a part of your self-talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we talk about sharing our grievances with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not about Him, but to Him last week. That you complain to Allah, you do not complain about Allah. And a part of your complaining process to Allah should look like, what is it that you dislike from this dunya? What is it that you're longing for in the akhirah? And using this as self-talk that, oh Allah, I'm going through this calamity and hardship. Help me get through this and grant me X, Y, and Z in the hereafter in exchange for my patience. You're making dua to Allah for help to be patient, but you're also making dua to Allah for the reward that you're seeking from Him. And this gives you something to look forward to. We're talking about internal motivation to get through trial. This is it right over here. That you know what you hate, you know what you love, and you're asking Allah, Oh Allah, take away what I hate and grant me what I love and make that from the hidden pleasures that I do not know about in this world, yet you grant me in the hereafter. And imagine that. Then imagine that you show up on the day of judgment and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you by your name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you Asad, He calls you Ridwan, calls you Shari, calls you Fatima, calls you Khadija, calls you Ambar, calls you whatever your name is. And He says, you made that deal with me on that day that you were struggling and you wanted that taken away. And you wanted this particular thing? Here it is. Can you imagine the joy you would feel at that time? Can you imagine what that experience would be like? And this goes back to that verse we were discussing. Did you find what your Lord promised you to be true? For surely the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are true. So there are hidden rewards that they're not mentioned in the Quran, they're not mentioned in the Sunnah. These are things that you would have contemplated and thought about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them to you as hidden treasures that are awaiting you. Just as long as you could get through this trial. And there is nothing wrong with asking help from Allah to get through this trial. You don't have to get through the trial by yourself. You just need to get through it. You have Allah as a part of your support system. You have your family and friends as a part of your support system. You have your community as a part of your support system. But get through that trial. And then await that reward that you privately discussed with Allah. That no one knows other than you and Allah. And imagine what that meeting will be like. Allahu Akbar. Which brings us to point number 15. Realizing the many hidden benefits it contains. And there's many ayat that the author brings over here. I'll share some of them with you. Um, the first one of them is Surah An-Nisa, verse number 19. فَعَسَىٰ أَن تَقْرُهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا That it may well be that you dislike something in which Allah has placed a lot of good. And then the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, 
وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ That perhaps you may dislike something, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it good for you. And then Allah, He goes on to mention one more in Surah An-Nur, verse number 11, where He says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُهُ شَرٌ لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ That those who propagated the lie against Aisha radiallahu anha, do not suppose it to be a bad thing for you, rather it is good for you. Now I want you to, you know, we'll, we'll discuss all these verses, but I want to focus on the one Surah An-Nur first. That when you study the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the, qissa to, uh, the, the story of the, of, the, of the slander against Aisha radiallahu anha was a very painful moment. It was a very, very painful moment for Aisha radiallahu anha specifically because she's being slandered for something that she didn't do and stories are being told about her. People are doubting her. People are, are sharing stories about her behind her back. Those that were close to her have left her off. Those that are still remained have some sort of doubt. And even her own husband, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, for a short period of time, distanced himself, trying to figure out what was going on. Yet she had the iman to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reveal something and clear my name. And that is what iman looks like. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about that incident that as painful as it was, don't consider it evil. Rather, this was something good. What was the good that came out of that story? What good potentially could have happened in the story? One of the biggest things that became clear in the community was who were the hypocrites and who were the believers? Those that were spreading this slander, they were clearly from the hypocrites. Those that gave the benefit of the doubt, then they were from the believers. From the benefits of this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows his continuous sunnah of proving the innocent as innocent even when all, a lot of people will, will, will disbelieve. From the benefits of this is that the virtues of Aisha radiallahu anha are mentioned in the Quran over here. From the benefits of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increased her reward and increased her forgiveness. From the benefits of this, we saw the human nature of the relationship between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. You rarely get to see that human element, but you see it in this point over here, where even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a human being needed that reassurance. He wanted further clarification from Allah because this had become a matter of the unseen to him. So these are just some of the benefits. Now, let's get back to the generality of the verses that came before. The one in Surah An-Nisa that perhaps you may dislike something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed much good in and perhaps you may dislike something that is good for you. I want you to think of examples from your life where you thought, SubhanAllah, how could this happen to me? Like this is such evil, this is such something so bad and so disturbing. Yet at the end of it, you learned and you saw that there was so much hidden wisdom in you not going, in, 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 in this trial taking place. And this is something that you have to contemplate and reflect. And this is something that if you want to talk about powerful exercises, once you understand this principle, document this in your own life. Things that you were tried with, things that you asked for that Allah didn't give you in this life, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced it with something better. Document those instances. And when you want to see the power of Allah, when you want to see the divine wisdom of Allah, go back to all of those instances where you thought it was bad, but in reality it turned out to be something good. Someone loses their job, someone gets divorced, someone goes through uh, another form of calamity, if at the end of the day it brought them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have been victorious. And that's what you need to realize. And then he mentions one example which I want to share with you. He says, when the tyrannical ruler took Sarah from Ibrahim, so he's talking about the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and the tyrannical ruler took away Sarah from him. He wanted to, to, to do terrible things with her. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected her and, and saved her from it. And eventually, when he gives Sarah back to Ibrahim, what else does he do? He gave Hajar to Ibrahim as well. He gave Hajar to Ibrahim as well. And who came from the lineage of Hajar? It was Ismail alayhi salam. And who came from the lineage of, of Ismail alayhi salam? 
None other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So if in that original trial that Sarah and Ibrahim are being tried with, where they're separated tyrannically, and then they weren't able to navigate their way out, they wouldn't, he wouldn't have received Hajar, and Ismail alayhi salam wouldn't have been born, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam wouldn't have come from their lineage, all as a result of being tried and being patient. So you never know which trials you go through, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about so much khair from it. And he quotes another line of poetry, how many are the blessings hidden under the veil of tribulations? That so many blessings come under the guise of being tried and tested. You just need to be able to see beyond the physical. Now, I want to try the, tie this into giving charity. You know, one of the things about giving charity is that the Prophet ﷺ tells us it doesn't decrease one's wealth. Now you may be thinking, I had five dollars, I just gave it in sadaqah to the masjid, how did this not decrease my wealth? You're looking at the physical reality only. You need to look at the spiritual realm behind this, that not only did you give five dollars, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplied and increased the barakah in your wealth, that which you cannot see. Your future risk has been increased, that which you cannot see, as a result of the five dollars that you gave. So that Iman is required. Now when you apply the same principle that when trials and tribulations come your way, and you see it from a spiritual lens and not a physical lens, that with this trial are coming so many hidden blessings and benefits in this life. In this life. The previous point was about the hereafter. We're now focusing on in this life. Every trial will come with benefits in this life. And that's the lens that you need to see with. So that when you go through hardship, you understand that there are benefits coming through it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of this in the Quran. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ That the trial is definite and limited. Whereas the ease that comes with it is indefinite and is multiple. So the ease that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings with every hardship is innumerous. But the trial itself will be limited. And that is the lens that you need to view it with. Which brings us to point number 16. Tribulation and hardship prevents one from evil. Vanity, boastfulness, arrogance, ostentation, and oppression. Were Nimrod someone poor and feeble, blind and deaf, he never would have argued with Ibrahim concerning his Lord. However, he was deceived into this by his sovereignty as pointed out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point of point number 16 is that trials and tribulations prevent a person from committing sin. Trials and tribulations prevent a person from committing sin. So this is the opposite side of when a person is being tried and tested, they naturally increase in their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when a person is being tested, it also decreases their sin. It also decreases their sin. And he gives specific examples that evil is something general, but vanity and boastfulness, showing off, thinking of yourself as someone mighty and proud and self-sufficient, arrogance, ostentation, showing off again, and oppression. That when a person is going through that hardship, it prevents them from doing these things. Why? Because it instills humility inside of yourself, realizing that you're not even in control of your own affairs. How can you dictate someone else's affairs? How can you judge someone else's affairs when you can't even rectify your own? It increases your dependence upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so it takes away your concept of self-sufficiency. And particularly in this day and age, when everything is about you, I want all eyes on me. I want all the focus to be on me. I will propagate myself as an influencer. I will propagate myself as an ideologue and a pundit. I will propagate myself as a leader. What have you actually achieved to put yourself in that situation? What, you have a thousand followers on Instagram? Is that supposed to be an achievement? What does that actually mean in real life change? It doesn't mean anything. And then when you realize that when you're being tried, the futility of those things in this life and the hereafter, you realize that you have no right to be committing any of those sins, particularly the sins of the heart that he goes on to mention. 
like vanity, like being boastful, like being oppressive towards others. When you can't even take care of your own self, who are you to be someone that is looked up to? And this applies to myself first and foremost. The reality is we are all slaves of Allah. And that is the point that needs to be brought back home. Without Allah, we are nothing. Without Allah, we are nothing. Without Allah, we are nothing. That is the point that needs to be driven home. And then he goes on to mention this point about uh, Nimrod, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الَّذِي حَاجَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ, uh, إبراهيم فِي رَبِّهِ أَنْ أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكِ that have you not seen the one who argued with Ibrahim السلام, about his Lord on the basis that Allah had given him sovereignty. That he became arrogant because Allah had given him so much. And then you look at the example of Fir'aun that he claimed that he is your Lord the Most High. وَقَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى He said this, why? Because he had power and, and he thought he had power and authority. So what you start to learn is the more power a person gets, the more authority a person gets, the more wealth a person gets, the more susceptible they become to corruption. The more power, authority, fame and wealth you get, the more susceptible you become to corruption. And that is why you should not seek those things out. If Allah gives them to you, embrace them and accept them and ask Allah's help to do due diligence in them. But these are not things that you should seek out because understand it opens up the doors to corruption and when those things aren't there there is less accountability and there is less opportunity for you to become corrupted and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions this in many many verses again in uh, surah shura surah number 42 verse number 27 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says walaw basata Allahu rizqa li ibadihi la bagaw fil ard that were Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give everyone the riches that they desire, they would have become tyrants upon this earth. They would have become tyrants upon this earth. Now I want you to think about the tyrannical dictators that live in our times. How many of them are poor? How many of them are poor? They're not. They're extremely, extremely rich. You look at the ones that have passed away, they literally found billions of dollars of gold, of people's money, the ummah's money, hoarded in their houses, right? So wealth, if it does not come with the proper intention of helping the ummah and helping the cause of Allah is a source of corruption. Leadership, if it does not come with the intention of helping the ummah and serving the ummah comes as a form of corruption. Fame, if it does not come with the intention of influencing people in the right direction and doing good deeds, it becomes a form of corruption. And these trials and tribulations show us the human side of that. That when people are tried with fame and with wealth and with authority, what happens to them? The vast majority of people fail, so don't always seek that out. Now the point he goes on to make, and it becomes much longer, is that look at the example of Muhammad wasallam, the companions and the previous prophets. How many of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were actually rich and had kingdoms? You have Sulaiman alayhi salam and Dawood alayhi salam. The vast majority of them were poor. The vast majority of them went through hardships. The vast majority of them were persecuted. So this shows us that very few people will thrive in the test of prosperity. If only two of the prophets of Allah are mentioned in such a state and the vast majority chose a life of poverty, they chose that life of poverty not because it was imposed, because they knew it was the only way to save themselves from corruption, even though they are the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though they are the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number 17. Being pleased and content with the tribulation such that it would lead to the pleasure of Allah, exalted is He. This is because both the righteous and sinner is afflicted with trial. Hence, whoever is malcontent at its onset, for him is displeasure and misery in this life and the hereafter. Whoever is pleased and content with it, for him lies in store the good pleasure of Allah, and that is greater than paradise 
and what it contains. For Allah the Exalted has said, وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٍ This is Surah Tawbah, verse number 72. And Allah's pleasure is even greater. And then he closes off with a dua. So now he comes to a very specific point, which is, what is your reaction at the onset of trial? Are you someone that when the trial comes, you are going to be content and happy and attain rida? Rida is a state of contentment. So not just being content, but being in a state of contentment. Or are you someone that is uh, displeased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I want to share uh, uh, a story with you on, on a very light note. And it's also a, an activity. So growing up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he blessed me with a, a sister that's four years older than me. And you know, for the, I would say the first half of our lives, it was a very turbulent relationship. Like I disliked her, she disliked me. And that was, a lot of it was due to her tyrannical nature. Um, the specific example that I'm thinking of is that because she was a girl, my, per my parents preferred her security and safety over all my own security and safety. But what did that look like? That every time she had a friend come over, it wasn't enough that I would go to the basement or go to my room. I would have to physically leave the house. My parents were like, if her friend is over, you need to leave the house, you can't stay there. For part of it, I think it was religious reasons. But for other part of it, I think it was just something my sister was like ashamed of me as a brother and she told my parents, look, I don't want him here when my friends are here. Um, so eventually, I ended up going to my aunt and uncle's house that live about 10 minutes away. Um, you know, I, I played video games there. I had friends come over, we played basketball. But in my aunt and uncle's house, they too had uh, a daughter uh, who's my cousin, who's six months younger than me. And it was interesting that I ended up spending so much time in their house, subhanAllah, that we ended up developing a sibling rivalry which is very strange, but I guess that's just the way cousins are in, like, cult in our culture. Um, where if I got a bicycle, she had to get a better bicycle. I got a laptop, she had to get a better laptop, right? And this is the way it continued. Now, eventually, every semester, uh, or every term rather, because this is in, in high school, uh, we would get our report cards. I would come home, I was so happy with my grades, because I, I knew how little I had studied to get those grades. So I'm hoping that when I would tell my parents my grade, they would be, you know, shabash, good job, you did amazing. But as soon as I tell them my grades, they would always ask me, but what did your cousin get? <laughs> and I was like, why do you need to know what my cousin got? Like, how is this even relevant? She's my cousin, right? She's not my sister. She's my cousin. Why do you care? And eventually I'd have to tell them, yeah, she beat me in this, she beat me in that. And then you'd see like that uh, disappointment smile. Yeah, you could have done better, couldn't tell you. And I'd always justify, you know, she wears hijab, she wears jilbab, she has no social life. Like, she just stays in the room and studies. I know, very prejudiced and judgmental, I know. But that was the reality of it. That's how I justified it in my head, and to them as well. But as is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every individual has their personal battle of Badr. For me, my personal battle of Badr came the day we went for our driving exam. So... She goes for her driving exam first. This is my cousin. And I, I don't admit to it, but the reality was I was at home and I'm like, Ya Allah, please let her fail. Ya Allah, please let her fail. <laughs> so she eventually comes home and she has tears in her eyes. And I'm like, are these tears of happiness or are these tears of failure? And she starts off by saying, Mama, Baba. There's awkward silence. I'm sorry I failed. And in the back of the house, you hear, Takbir! Allahu Akbar! <laughs> now this brings an unprecedented amount of pressure on me. Because if I don't pass that driving exam, I have no dignity left in this household. <laughs> so I want you guys to do the driving exam with me. Mr. Aziz, welcome to your final driving exam. I would like you to reverse out of the parking lot. I get into the car, I put on my seatbelt, I look at my mirrors, everything is good to go. I turn on the car, Bismillah, make my du'as, and I put my foot on the brake, and I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going back, BOOM! <laughs> What's the first word that came to your mouth? Don't say it out loud, we are in the masjid. Now, 
the reason why I share this example that yes, we shared it in good jest and fun, but this activity actually proves a lot. And that is what is your natural reaction to calamity? For some people it is to freeze and do nothing. For other people, it is to say a bad word, something that they would regret had they died upon it. And for others, and this is what we're trying to, to achieve and get to, is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, الَّذِينَ إِذَا صَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ That those individuals, when they're struck by calamity and trial, they say, indeed, to Allah we belong, and to Him we shall return. Which is the very first point of this book. That you realize you belong to Allah. You are a property, a thing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Is either point number two. Uh, that you are the property of Allah. So that naturally when calamity strikes, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I tie this into the last point of the book. Because as I mentioned last week, this is not a form of, you know, edutainment that we're trying to get. We're educated and being entertained at the same time. What we're looking for is for transformation. And that is why I mentioned at the end of last week that please go home and look at those 10 points and see which from amongst them you can start to implement and reform your soul and refine your soul so that you get closer to Allah and you create this optimism in times of calamity and trial and you create this level of optimism that I will be okay through this trial. Inshallah, there's something hidden that is good for me that I don't see and there's much, much more reward for me in the hereafter. And you keep refining your soul to the degree that when the calamity strikes next time, you're like, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And you're thinking about the trial could have been greater. The trial could have been in my faith. I could have lost patience. All the things that we discussed, you're saying, Alhamdulillah. And you're reaching that level of rida, that level of contentment, that I'm content with everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees. And this is what this point is all about. That eventually you attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when I asked what would you like to, to see in Jannah, one of the sisters mentioned to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, according to the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the greatest blessing the believers will have is to see the beautiful face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst them. And this is something you can't fathom, you can't understand. How can that be the most enjoyful moment of Jannah? How about the car that I want? How about this that I want? How about that that I wanted? Seeing the face of Allah is more pleasurable to me. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. That the pleasure of Allah, getting to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter is the greatest blessing that you will have in the hereafter. Better than anything that you desire. And this goes back to that internal motivation that if you can make that your focus in life, that I'm living my life to eventually see the beautiful face of my Lord, that is what transformation looks like. That will decrease the amount of sins, that will increase the amount of good deeds, that will make you take more advantage of your time and decrease the amount of time that is wasted. That will make you have vision and purpose in your life and take away that emptiness and that void that human beings feel without the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ That the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even greater. And then I want to conclude with the dua that he makes. He says, these are, be these are brief per uh, perusals into what comes to mind concerning the benefits of tribulation. We ask Allah that He forgives us and gives us well-being in this world and the hereafter. May Allah grant us the accord to enact that which He loves and is pleased with. Peace and blessings be upon Muhammad, his family, his companions. Allah is sufficient for us and what an excellent disposer of affairs He is. This was a six-page treatise, a six-page essay that he put together in a very short period of time when someone had asked him what are some of the benefits uh, and, and wisdoms of trials and tribulation. And he says, this is just something short that I've put together. This is the, like, the first couple of things that came to mind. And you can imagine the deep level of scholarship that is required. Hey, 
If you're sitting on the LRT and you're like, okay, let me jot down some benefits and trials, uh, benefits and, and wisdoms, and this is what you come up with. Now, the point arises, where do we go from here? Where we go from here, my dear brothers and sisters, is you keep revising this material. The videos are, are up online. Last week's is already up, inshallah, this will be up soon. You download the book, you go through the book, and every couple of months you go through it. Anytime you go through a trial, anytime you know someone going through a trial, return back to this book. See what you can implement. And make this something transformational and not just something that you attended for the sake of attending. Jazakum Allah khairan for attending. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha ilaha ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.